Hello, this is Janet Gallen, another episode of Love Letters Live. And today's guest is Adam Sherman, who was a previous guest and talked, Adam, you talked about the book you wrote. And why don't you just say the title of it again for people who might want to get it, especially after hearing you talk today. Hello, Janet. First of all, it's great to be back again. I had a great time the first time I was here. And for all the newcomers to this episode, I'm the author of a book called Living Beyond Normal, an Autistic Autobiography. And let's just start right in with that because, <clears throat> excuse me, I bought the book. I had the pleasure of reading it. And then I brought it into the Trader Joe's for you to autograph it. But anyway, not everybody's going to be able to do that. Um, and I was struck by so many things. You have a great deal to say and a great deal to teach and about you know living on the spectrum and about life in general. And I noticed that you are one of the bravest fellows I've ever met. Yes, your, your strength and courage in having to face some of the um, daunting troubles that you did growing up different. Let's start with that because last time we were gonna talk about kindness, being kind. Why don't you say something about being kind and how important that is? First of all, hearing all that from you, it, it means everything, because that's exactly what I want people to know, that we're so much more than our first impressions. There's a lot more going on inside that a lot of people either can't or simply refuse to see. And that is exactly where the, the concept of kindness comes in, which is especially relevant in this time, because we're dealing with some people, some areas of thought where it's like you're trying to rewrite the very definition of reality. Like some people attempting to say that, hey, foul is now fair. No now means yes. Hatred, <laughs> is, lo hatred is love. And well, that let, me, let me say something about that when you say first impressions. So I remember once going into a store and there was a woman behind the counter and she was clearly, we were not connecting. We, you know, we just weren't understanding each other. And her, her, she was tense. And it, it occurred to me, I don't know what she's going through <clears throat> privately inside. And maybe she's just unable for the moment. It turns out that she was on the spectrum as we, this was years ago, as we would now know. And truth be told, she probably should have been given some other job in the store instead of having to be in charge of stacking up multicolored piles of sweaters. Um, and talk about that. Talk about when you see somebody who's not doing what you want them to do, what you should do. I can actually give a very recent example of that because Please. you mentioned earlier, and yes, for the record, I do have one of two jobs, one of which is a clerk at Trader Joe's. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met our lovely host today. And there's actually a new recruit that we brought on recently. And he also happens to be on the spectrum like me. Uh -huh. now, in terms of, I'd say, something that many people would think that you can't work with or there's no basis or concept to, to do so, there's actually, there's always a way, in my opinion, as long as you open your mind to the possibility that something that you might write off as strange or unacceptable actually has a, uh, it can be seen as an asset, can actually be used in a certain way. This person who I worked with, he is very different. He's not into a lot of traditional interests of men his age. He also holds on to a lot of things that he liked as a child, one of which is uh, building blocks. And while many people may be very quick to write that off as a very weird obsession, as something that has no basis in his job, as a matter of fact, that turns out, if you allow yourself to see far enough, there's a way to work that. So when I realized that he has an obsession for building blocks, I realized it actually couldn't be more perfect for how I can train him in the operations of the store. Because How did you do that? Well, for one thing, we're always trying to keep up appearances and structure for various products that our customers really like. How best to do that? Through presentation. And presentation takes a lot more work than you may think. So using analogies 
for children's building blocks, he's been able to focus himself, apply himself, using that picture in his mind to build up and break down displays. Adam, can you tell us how you were able to, I mean, what did you actually do to evoke either the concept or the picture of building blocks in how he was supposed to work? I did got to know him. That's it. What? It's, it's simple. I got to know him. There's an uh, idea. The archaic notion that is still used in many businesses today is that you should keep your personal life and your professional life separate. But sometimes it's actually good to bridge those gaps. And therein lies the possibility that it can be used in the professional setting. I got to know him because I want him to feel like he's no different than the rest of the crew. I want him to be able to freely share his interests, to talk to other people and be included. And through that, I was able to find out that interest of his in which I realized at the same time, I could apply it to how we face product, structure product, build up displays, and he's doing a very stellar job because oh, of that. Nice. Okay, so I want to ask you something else. At what point, I mean, I've done this, and at what point do you get to say to somebody who doesn't seem to be understanding what you're talking about or is confused, at what point do you get to say quite openly, am I confusing you? Am I being confusing? It's a matter okay. of attempting to both read the signs, but also make the person feel like they can say to you that they don't understand something right. or yes. they just need a little more clarification. I don't ever want someone to think that it's stupid or unkind to question oh. your superior. Good. But we're not, we may have more experience, but we're not infallible beings. We can be wrong. And sometimes even our proteges have something to offer. And he certainly did. Well, you know, that, that brings up kind of an interesting point for, um, I guess the human resources department or whatever, whoever does the hiring that you, you get to say right off the bat, if there's something that's confusing to you, feel free to say so. We all understand things differently. That, that should be part of the process. It should. So I talk should. about, talk about when you talk about kindness, let's kind of segue over to, you were the um, subject of a great deal of horrible bullying Yes, yeah, I, I really was. Uh, talk about talk about some of those episodes, and if you feel comfortable doing that. I know it's it's fine, and I mean it may, will mean that I will have to. And it's all over your book, so anybody who reads it's going to see it anyway. Yes, of course. And while I really want people to get this book, read its contents, really take in the information, I can certainly divulge a little bit of that right now. Of course. Uh, I By the way, there's no such thing as a spoiler in this book because there's so much in it and it's all in your voice and go ahead. Of course. No, I like that. Um, so I guess if there's one very prominent part of my book that I would like to share openly, it's that it was a time in my life where I realized that there were three groups of people. Uh, some are, and thankfully it's a small number, but some are so indoctrinated in a specific way of thinking or have moments in their life where it really is more black and white than it actually really is. And they, they believe it so much that nothing's ever going to change that. Like and what kind of things are they indoctrinated for this group? Well, as I said, there are those who mistaken, you know, uh, intolerance for, uh, you know, love, like a love of keeping things the way they are, like stuff like that. Okay. So a negative. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. And I kind of I experienced that a little bit when I was going through job training with the federal government doing uh, a specific program in which I was a chosen volunteer for America doing emergency response in the deep south of the country. And during that time, I discovered two things about what I was a part of is that while the service I did, I would never take any of it back. The program itself was very poorly set up. It was a kind of a one size fits all program where you either had to handle it or get out. And some people there acted like they didn't even believe in the concept of mental health, that everyone has certain limits. Some of us have certain specific needs. Some of us need resources and they weren't providing it because of that hard held belief that you're either thick skinned or you're not. And because of that, they lost a lot of people including myself, but that's another story. Well, well talk, talk about the, 
Okay, so there's kind of a continuum of kindness also, like bullying to really kind and loyal. Yes. So what uh, would the next step up be? Um, After the next the third of the... Well, the next step up, the, the larger group is that, you know, we all go through certain types of experiences and stimuli in our lives, but not all of them, not all of us end up in a specific mode of belief that we can never shake. Others they have the capacity to change. It just takes certain experiences, certain people, oh. certain revelations to help bring about what often ends up being a positive change in their lives. Have That's you been that person in other people's lives sometimes? In some to ways, about, yes. To bring about a shift of how people perceive? Not just for how other people perceive, but also myself. There were times where I did believe there was a very specific order to things, but as I grew up, as I got more education, as I allowed myself more experiences, I realized things were not as black and white as I thought, that there were shades of gray at the very least, or at other times there were things that I thought were inflexible that were actually quite flexible. And Good for you, that's wonderful. L let me ask you about growing up because you know I feel <clears throat> that those young experiences, I mean, we've all been, we've all faced bullies. <laughs> um, and, what happens to you at the hands of a bully when you're very young, through your teens, is so harsh. Talk about, if you would, some of the instances or some of the experiences you had growing up, like in your early teens, or at, you know, at the hands of people who were just not very kind. Well, I mean, to paraphrase uh, from a show I watched a while back, we forget half of what we are learned in school, but when it comes to the traumas we've been through and the people who inflicted them, we all have an elephant's memory. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I was say, so what were some of those? I know that there were there were a couple of people in your life who started off friendly and kind of turned at some point, and that was horrifying. Yes, um, someone who I consider to be my best friend for a good right. few I mean, years. I mean, so um, what, ha what happened with that, and how old were you? I was in high school, so but I'd known him since we were 12. And I'd say I was around 15, 16. And this is what really also made it probably one of the hardest parts of my life, which is he told me that he believed he was on the spectrum too. Uh -huh. That, you know, he never really fit in with a lot of people. And, but he managed to find at least a group of friends who understood. And I, I felt like I was a part of that. But you see, every single autistic is different. And I was kind of that person who was a little more impulsive, wanted to be seen, didn't want to hide in the shadows. I did some attention seeking. And unfortunately, I found out the hard way that for starters, he was my best friend, but I wasn't his because he already had one who had preceded me like years before he met me. I wasn't bothered by it because I felt like we all still gave the same amount of attention to each other. Mm -hmm. But I found out the hard way that his best friend, I don't know whether it was a mental issue or just simply how he was raised, but if you disrespected him even once in a, in a public fashion, oh, he'd I never see. forgive you for the rest of his life. And not only did he do that to me and made me feel like a complete fool in front of everyone when I tried to apologize, but he never stopped trying to convince him that I was not worth being in his life. At first he resisted. What, what, did, you, what did you do with that painful experience? Just, were you just able to let him go? No, for the longest time. I mean, I know that he did something that gave a, an air of finality to it, but even if I wasn't really talking to him, it still just made me endlessly question, like, if this is who he was, if this is what he really thought of me, how many more deceit and lies are there in my own relationships oh so, so it kind of poisoned how you saw other things like maybe i truly had no idea what other people were or how they perceived me and what does that make me that was always that questioning well, well let's talk about that how people perceived you so there were people who really were not nice to you because you were visibly behaviorally different mm -hmm. and by the way i mean i must say that behaviorally different is kind of minor when you look at the big picture, but I guess to, to teens and kids who want everything to be what? So 
exactly easily, the same. Or, understandable and all, yes. There, there's a very narrow range of what's acceptable, I guess, at some point in life for some, you know, teens and children. Who are the people who are the, let's talk about the kind people. Of course, they're, thankfully, especially those who do read my book, you'll find that for every bad experience I had, there was plenty of good too, especially okay. when I went looking for it. How do you look for it? So I finally decided to just lean into something that it may not have been acceptable in the place where I was growing up, but it was acceptable outside of it. Like I was not one for traditional sports. I tried to do like cross country, track. It just never fit with me. So it was uh, untraditional, like athletic, like activities that I liked. And I found as a teenager that I had an enormous interest and obsessive love for urban street hip hop dancing. Oh, good for you. Okay. Thankfully yeah. not being too far away from the Bay Area, you know, growing up in the East Bay, I could always just hop the train, get over to Oakland, Hayward, Berkeley. And I met a lot of good people out there. And Who were part of that hip hop culture? And it's more than just dance. It's more, it's more about just kind of a fraternity of people who they know they're different and dance among other things allows them to not only free themselves through their bodies, but also their minds. They're able to come up with new routines. And in doing so, they also find out more about themselves and the people around them, the flexibility of thought, of ideas, of how you view other people. That's what was really a huge saving grace of mine. Well, so you knew where to look for something that you needed. Good for you. What, what about within school? Who were the people who befriended you? Girls and boys. In school, there weren't that many because, again, this is where a lot of my issues were. And it was in a small community that, in fact, others would say the same who grew up with me, who at least, I guess, came to that realization later. We were in a bubble. It may have, we may not have been far from the rest of the San Francisco Bay Area, but it was its own sphere. What I, bubble was it? It's just uh, its own rules, its own society, its own ways of thinking, a lot of which was just divorced from the flexibility and progressive thinking of the rest of the Bay Area. But like, was, it, was it negative or difficult ways of thinking? It, there's no uh, one way to describe it, but in, in, in the simplest of terms, I would say that there were a lot of people who they didn't like the idea of consistent change. They didn't like the idea of, of constant differences. They wanted to keep things simple and understandable and anything that infringed on that was treated with that idea that you should instantly fear or hate what you don't understand or what doesn't fit into what was constructed in that That's little- terrible, society. yes. <clears throat> now, who, what about teachers? Did you have teachers who came to your aid who did things that really, you know, saved you from the doldrums of being different or what? I like to say that the greatest irony of my interactions was I was far better at bonding with parents than my own peer group and teachers were no exception. The older they were, the easier it was for me to actually bond with them. What do you think? Well, they often said that they saw an old soul within me, someone oh. who was very naturally polite, very understanding, who wanted to know more, fill his head with as much information as possible. And what better people to turn to than the ones that were trying to convince other, uh, other people, other peers of mine to do the same. And through that, I really developed a lot of uh, kinship with a lot of my teachers, certain parents, those who really liked a naturally curious person like myself. Are you still in any way in touch with any of those teachers? Do you know anything about them today? I was, I was for some time, some years, but as in life, right. eventually you do grow into the place that you're in. I have not been back to my hometown of Lafayette in years, but I'd like to believe that they're doing just fine, whether they're still teaching or not. Well, I have a question that is something that really would tempt me. I don't know how you'd feel about it, but you know, you've become quite a wonderful man. You've got a book to your credit, a wonderful book, by the way. And do these teachers know about this? Not since uh, I started writing. I may have mentioned it to 
some people back in the day that I may that I was toying with the idea of writing a book. But I'm just they, wondering if you knew where these teachers were, or if they're teaching at the same school, would they love to have a, a, a note from you saying, "I just wanted to fill you in. You you know you were so helpful to me, and I, I wanted you to know where life has taken me now, and let them know about your book." And also, do they ever have speakers? at that school. I mean, what a wonderful place for you to, to go and give a presentation of your book. Do they have library events or what? It would be really great to do that. And you're right. I should, especially as the book has been gaining more popularity, I should go back to my roots, seek out those who did, you know, positively influence me. Really? And perhaps that can bring generational change if the book were to be included in the library or the idea that today's students get to hear. Or I mean, to have, to have a book written by one of their own alum in their library to, 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 oh, how tempting would that be for them to say, yeah, I think you should do it. I completely agree. I have already been trying to get my book into certain school districts in San Francisco. I want students to be able to read this experience and know, especially if any of them do believe that they are different in their thoughts and actions, that they're not in any way alone, and that true tolerance can be realized through, you know, education and opportunities to show that we really are so much more alike than people want to believe. It's a tough journey. It's yeah. not all simple, but it's- Well, yours was not all simple. And, you know, the the, the pain, it was such a, a, a balance or such it doesn't even matter equal parts. It was so loaded with pain and loaded with joy and loaded with growth that would you say, because you mentioned this way in the beginning, you know, you can forget what they taught you, but you don't forget how they treated you. Would you say that the people who were particularly kind to you had as much power as the people who were nasty to you? It was all about a balancing of scales, about seeing from my perspective, did the good outweigh the bad, vice versa, or is there really some stability there? And I will say using that uh, metaphor, for a long time, the scales were tipped towards those who were dragging me into darkness, but then yes. for a while, it then began to lift again and started going towards the light. But with time and maturity and understanding the flexibility of our own lives at that point it becomes a never-ending but crucial battle of knowing within your own psyche what is the perfect balancing of scales how do i confront continued adversity how do i allow for the positivity to prevent myself from falling into a chasm again that's always the constant battle in life but it doesn't always have to be a complete tipping one way or the other, because sometimes there is such thing as too much of a good thing as there is too much of horrible things in your life. It's all about that consistent but worthwhile battle to keep everything completely even. What would be an example, I can't even picture one, of too much of a good thing, if it's really a good thing, but what would be too much of a good thing? There was a time when even in school and beyond, and by school, I mean college, Mm -hmm. where I finally did manage to find some people who I could enjoy myself with socially. But that also involved, you know, pushing my limits, maybe maybe even experimenting with stuff that could actually be bad for my health later on down the line. Oh. The difference is, though, that I was at least, I, I discovered that I was sensitive enough to know what was good for me mentally and physically and what wasn't. So you're saying the good thing would be the friendships and the too much of it would be where it crosses over into friendship requiring you to do something that's not good for yourself? Yeah, like some people, they just love to go out and party and drink and not think about the rest. Others, they just they just want to, you know, add more like adventure in their lives, like let their impulses run wild. I can say with certainty from both what I've experienced and what I've seen is that if you let yourself be defined by your impulses, the end result ends up with you and everyone around you getting hurt. So there's such thing as finding time to let yourself, well, let go and enjoy things and then steal yourself back to reality where, you know, 
too much, something too much of a good thing can, you know, explode in your face. If you're not careful enough, let yourself get dragged down by all the horrible things in your life can put you in a place you might never come out from. So you so have to be aware of with this good thing of a new group of friends where you have your limit about what you will do. I believe the uh, old term is everything in moderation. Okay. Now, what about, what about, um, I had a question a minute ago and I'm just, when you look back now from your vantage point of your, you know, a mature, intelligent fellow, can you look back at some of these people who were bullying and so mean, can you look back at that and see that they were suffering their own demons? that required them to find somebody they could be superior to in some way in their own heads? With a couple of exceptions, I would say the vast majority of those who did make it really difficult for me. Yeah, they most likely were because, I mean, here's what I do believe. I believe just the idea that someone even conceives in their mind that they have to either act one way or another compared well, when they're faced with something they don't understand that's a struggle in itself because they don't realize that there's always another way beyond their thinking of one or the other. You don't have to be fearful of something that you don't understand. You don't have to hate something that you perceive as a threat because it's different. You have to find another way. Why is something that's different a threat, do you think? Perhaps because uh, it, it comes from everything, from our everything from our parents uh, teaching us about stranger danger to the stuff that we see or hear through the grapevine or on the news that if you think that one bad thing happened because of a certain way, if anything even comes close to that, uh. automatically put a one size fits all on it and think, okay, because this person's acting that way compared to what I saw in the news, that's automatically something I should keep at arm's length or maybe even, you know, report to the authorities or whatever. And when people act in such a way that they abuse that system, whether they know it or not, innocent people really get hurt or worse. Yeah. That's well, exactly uh, how I started. I, I want to thank you for doing this and coming back to talk to me more because this whole business about kindness, you know, until until late in our lives, and I'm late in my life because I'm over 80, you know, hmm. and the people who were particularly kind really do stand out. But the people who were bullies and miserable, and I had a couple in my life, too, they were horrible. I remember their names. I could pick them out if they line up today. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it stays with you. And it's, you, I'm asking you, I guess, do you get to a point where you can really say these people don't matter to me in my life? Well, certain things, you know, again, we have an elephant's memory when it comes to a lot of the traumas that we deal with. Right. But I think it's important. And I've known this through my own personal growth, through my father's Jewish side in the community, through a number of avenues that it's important to learn to forgive, but you must never forget because oh, good. yes. Okay. That's what, that's what makes. Yes. It's what makes you who you are. You're I'm here because of all the things that happened to me, good and bad. Yes. And I've, I've chosen to shape them in a way that I believe is a positive experience. And not to mention, I want to say briefly, especially for those who might now be considering getting my book, if you go on to Amazon and you look at the reviews of those who have read it and said something about it, one of them stands out in particular, one that says, it is impossible to read this book and not stop and reflect on all the interactions we've had in the past and what we can do for our future. And for me, that probably sums it up perfectly because we cannot change the past. We cannot change what we've done to others, but we can do better for our future. And if possible, if we feel that we must, we can also make amends to those in our past. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. And what a nice chance for people to make amends to you. But I want to thank you for doing this. I love talking to you. And I, I want to say just in you know, because I'm about love letters or letters and the power of love letters, I can only imagine the power that a note from you to your to the present principal of that school, to any teachers who might, the power of that is just enormous, I think. I hope you drop them a note. I hope you drop somebody a note. And I was a student, I was a graduate of your school, and it wasn't always easy, but here's what where I am now. 
I've written a book. I'd love to come talk to your students about it at any kind of assembly. If you're, please do that. Of course, I'll do that, though I would like to say, because this is actually a perfect opportunity to say so, I did do something similar to a love letter recently. Um, there was someone who was in college with me. We were good friends, but then for reasons that were his own, he pushed me away and didn't want me to be a part of something that we'd been a part of for a while. But then about a few months ago, he wrote to me on his own saying that he had done some reflecting and realized he should never have treated me the way oh, he Oh, excellent. And that he oh, wanted to excellent. apologize for it. And I said, I really, ex I accepted it and I really appreciate it. And you know what I ended up uh, doing here? I said, there is a way you can help make up for it. And what that resulted in his job at a synagogue in Berkeley that allowed for me to do one of my first presentations of my Fabulous. book. Okay, good, good, good. And because of letter writing. All right, I'm going to tell you goodbye for now and send you off with a kiss and a wish for everything good in your life. And I'll talk to you later. You might just bring me back again. Who knows? <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. So meanwhile, yes, just thank you for this. And um, yeah, we'll talk again. We'll talk again. Absolutely. Thank you, dear. Bye. Thank you, Bye.